Miyamoto Musashi is a name that almost everyone in Japan knows. He is a legendary swordsman, arguably the best to ever wield a katana. Musashi's life is so legendary that much of it has become mythical, and a myriad of dramatic, fictionalized accounts of his adventures became popular in the centuries after his death. Chief amongst them is Eiji Yoshikawa's seminal 1934 novel that immortalized the legend. In Yoshikawa's tale, Musashi starts out as many heroes do, a teenager with a big ego seeking fame and fortune out in the big world. But as his journey begins in 1584, Musashi will soon discover that true honor, strength, and even the name you bear is not something you're born with, it's something you earn in a moment unlike any other in which a choice is made that will determine the course of your future. As for our story, it shifts to Karakuen Stadium. In the year 1959, it is home to Japan's team, the Yamayori Giants, the team that launched professional baseball in Japan and in the game's young history in the land of the rising sun. No team has, as of yet, contributed more to its luster. Kawakami, Yonamine, Beto, Chiba, Starfin, and the mythical Sawamura all played on this field in that uniform. Their stadium holds the same magnitude the team does for the Japanese people. During the season, it is a routine sellout, and it is only when it hosts non-Giants games that it's easy to grab a seat. On game day, its atmosphere is electric. Crowds flock to the heart of Tokyo. Traffic stops from miles around. Vendors shout out to the gathering public, selling out their wares in minutes to the passers-by eager for a souvenir. The fans pile in, the game begins, and the titans of baseball put on a show for the ages that no one in the stands will ever forget. This is the scene for every home game every year. Tonight, however, the occasion has somehow doubled in magnitude. Tonight is Thursday, June the 25th. The Giants are set to welcome their bitter rivals, the Hanshin Tigers, into their friendly confines this evening. They've gotten off to an excellent start coming off a disappointing Japan Series defeat in 1958, and the Tigers have been playing catch-up all year long. The Tigers haven't done a bad job at that. It is sadly their lackluster offense holding them up from success. They're rebuilding after the core led by Fumio Fujimura has aged out of their window of competition. Young shortstop and eventual CL Best 9 winner Yoshio Yoshida has managed to distinguish himself in the meantime, having learned exceptional defense from Fujimura, though he's still finding his stroke with the bat. Katsumi Fujimoto, eventual CL Best 9 at first base in 59, is the one leading the charge on the sputtering offense. Where the Tigers really shine, however, is on the mound. Their rotation is the most exceptional in all of Central League. The one-two punch of tricky palm baller Masaaki Koyama and the rookie phenomenon Minoru Moriyama have been mowing down hitters with reckless abandon. Moriyama was going to do great things, it was very clear. And indeed, he'd win 18 games, strike out nearly 300 batters and post a 1.19 ERA in his rookie year. Koyama would get the ball tonight, though. No slouch himself, he would finish the year on a 1.86 ERA and a 20-game winner. The Giants were always a challenging foe year in and year out, and his opposite number was another of NPB's young, talented stars on the mound, the Kyojin ace, Motoshi Fujita. The reigning Central League MVP was coming off a year in which he won 29 games and pitched an astounding 330 innings. In hindsight, his short career should not have been a surprise to anyone. But tonight, he is the most appropriate man to take them out to face the Osaka Tigers in front of the most distinguished fan in baseball history. Oh yeah, I'm not sure that I mentioned. Emperor Hirohito was attending his first ever baseball game tonight. Indeed, this was the night of the first of many Tenranjiai, better known as the Emperor's Game. Coming off their defeat at the hands of the Lions in 58, Yamiori's offense came back swinging, 
Sophomore third baseman Shigeo Nagashima followed up his magnificent rookie campaign, hitting over 300 with 29 homers and 37 steals, leading the offense in home runs, RBIs, and batting average once again. If the Giants were going to carry the day in front of the Emperor, the smart money was on him to be the one to win or lose the game with his performance. As the Imperial family took their seats, the Giants' rookie first baseman looked on. Like a lot of the players on the field tonight, his nerves were very heavy. Try as he might to stretch his body and keep it loose, any attempts to become less tense had thus far failed. However, the young hitter was especially nervous tonight, more than anyone on his team. He was due for a good game, and he knew that. Of all nights, he could not fail on this one. Failure tonight would most certainly mean back to Sumit Award in disgrace, and begrudgingly taking that post as an electrical engineer his father had wanted desperately for him to take all those years ago. This, the Emperor's game, was Sadaharu O's last chance. He had hit his first home run at the professional level already earlier that year, but his contributions to the offense had been non-existent to the point that his bat was a near complete hindrance to the Giants' ability to win. They won in spite of him. 1959 would end with O striking out 72 times in 94 games. The kanji character for O denotes king in the Japanese language. Unfortunately for Sadaharu, this would prove a very effective tool for ridicule from Giants fans to respond to his woes at the plate. Whenever he would come to the plate, came a chant. O, O, Sanshin O, the strikeout king. Not at all the way his career was supposed to begin. Maybe tonight would change that. Maybe a good game in front of Hirohito would change that. Only one way to find out. Koyama and Fujita went to work against one another. Each got through two innings unscathed, but after Teruo Namiki made his way on base, Koyama flicked a base hit into the outfield to plate the first run of the ball game. Down one nothing, bottom of the fifth, however. Nagashima stepped up to the plate and crashed Koyama's pitch out of the ballpark. Center fielder Kazuhiko Sakazaki came up next and followed Nagashima's blast with a rocket of his own to make it 2-1 Giants. They did not hold the lead for long. Yoshida stepped up in the top of the sixth, singled up the middle, swiped second, and then flew around the bases to score on another RBI single from Hidefumi Miyake to tie the game. Up came Katsumi Fujimoto, who, not to be outdone by his rival sluggers, hammered a homer over the right field wall to give the Tigers a 4-2 lead. Their lead was slim and vanished quickly. Sakazaki led off for Yamiuri in the bottom of the seventh. He made his way on base to bring the tying run to the plate, and up came Sadaharu O. The nerves were overwhelming. The noise deafening, the situation of the utmost intensity. All of the strikeouts, all the failures, all the mistakes bubbled to the surface in that electrifying moment. Every eye in the stadium was fixed upon the one-time high school phenom, who to this point was nowhere near anyone's expectations, including his own. All of that would need to be shut out. He kicked the dirt in the box and fixed his eyes upon Koyama. The at-bat commenced. Fleeting for everyone else, but excruciatingly long for Salaharu. As time slowed to a halt, he finally got a pitch he liked. It sailed over the right field porch and into the seats. This jubilation would, in time, become a regular occurrence for Giants fans, but right now, this was a pleasant surprise off the bat of the disappointing rookie. The game was tied 4-4 in the seventh inning. So far, this baseball thing was really agreeing with His Majesty. But he was only scheduled to stay until 9.15 that evening, so hopefully the game would be over by then. Who wouldn't want to see the end of this one, after all? With Koyama entering the bottom of the eighth gassed, the Tigers looked to Murayama, spectacular all year, to keep things tied. He and O would go on to battle each other in many spectacular duels in the years to come. Moriyama entered the eighth and set the Kyojin down in spectacular fashion. One, two, three. He brought his team up to bat in the ninth with a chance to take the lead. 
but it was squandered. The good news was, there was no way the Giants would bury this one in the ninth with how Murayama was pitching, and the game would most surely go to extras. The bad news was, the Imperial couple would miss the end if that happened. Most fans knew this, and panic set in. As the baseball gods would have it though, like everyone everywhere who loves baseball, the gods of the sport would see to it that Hirohito's first baseball game ever was as memorable as possible. It was 9-12 as the bottom of the ninth began, and the first batter of the inning was Shigeo Nagashima. Mariyama missed with two pitches, but managed to notch two strikes on the talented young slugger. The 2-2 pitch was called for. It was a high fastball in on the hands, trying to tie Nagashima up, setting down the Giants' cleanup man. The pitch would never find the catcher's glove. Hirohito leaned forward in his seat, his eyes fixed on the action. And though advanced in his age, in that moment, he was all of us. Young or old, rich or poor, discovering a passion that would consume us all until the end of our days. How great this game is indeed. Murayama, for his part, claimed the ball went foul until the day he died. And according to legend, Nagashima chose not to argue with him until his old rival was admitted into the hospital where he would later pass away. And as the story goes, Nagashima very politely, calmly, and warmly told him like it was. Mr. Murayama, the homer counts. That ball was fair. The Giants had won it. And all of Tokyo was celebrating. The giant star had hit the most incredible home run in history to win the most incredible game in history, all in front of the Emperor and Empress, cheering and clapping along with the rest of the Karakuen fans. As for our friend Sanshin Oh, he had plenty to be proud of. He had played a crucial part in the Giants' victory, and he had played well in the field and performed in the clutch when his team needed it most. Now the Emperor knew his name along with Nagashima's, but it was Nagashima who got to meet the Imperial family. Nagashima who earned the accolades. Nagashima, whose stellar sophomore campaign led the Giants to the first of a long stretch of championships to wrap up the 50s and into the 60s. For though he had shown great promise and stellar natural ability, Saraharu O would continue to be known as nothing but the strikeout king, unless something could be done, and soon. Shinmen Takezo and his friend Honhiden Matahachi arm themselves and march off to war to fight for the forces of Toyotomi Hideyoshi at the iconic battle of Sekigahara. They are confident, strong, patriotic, and entirely too sure of their skills with the sword. Things go wrong as the boys are forced to flee into the mountains. It is here that the young Takezo repels a group of bandits, killing their leader with what would become his most iconic weapon, a wooden buck-in. After Matahachi vanishes, Takizo returns home a wanted man, a deserter, but a confident and ferocious warrior nonetheless. He stays on the move, preserving his life at every turn, killing members of the occupying force right and left, until he is outwitted by an unlikely foe, a Buddhist priest by the name of Takwan Soho, another mythical figure with origins in history. Takwan strings up the young warrior to a cryptomeria tree in front of the local temple. At Takizo's lowest moment, he taunts the boy, chides him for the life he's lived, and laments the fact that in this, his first great defeat, the opportunity for a rebirth into a new man and a new warrior will be wasted on a condemned man. Takizo has a choice to make, die weak or survive strong. The night before his scheduled execution, the beautiful Otsu, the woman who will later become the love of Takizo's life, frees him and they run for the hills. He leaves her to make an attempt to rescue his captive sister, but is swiftly apprehended and brought to Himeji Castle, once again by the wily priest. Takizo was imprisoned in Himeji for three years, his only company, books on Zen, war, and courtly manners. When Takwan finally releases him, Lord Terumasa gives Takezo a new name, upon which he will stake his skill and reputation on for the rest of his life. 
Miyamoto Musashi. Though 1959 was a good year for the Giants, Sadaharu's rookie year was one to forget. What was supposed to be a magical time for him playing alongside his boyhood idols was instead a time of pain and frustration. He was hitting the fastball beautifully during this time, but struggled against pitches that had any kind of break. He couldn't hit anything that wasn't a straight fastball. It was cute, said Hiroshi Gondo, a pitcher who'd been in the league just as long as he had. He had a massive hole in his swing, causing a very nasty uppercut motion in his back path. Tetsuharu Kawakami, dry as he might, could not find any sort of consistency in the young man's offensive abilities. He wanted Nagashima to have some protection in the lineup. Luckily, he didn't need it. Even still, O's promise and potential did shine through, and he had some big home runs in the 1961 Japan Series. But for the money, and the hype, and the pressure, he was performing nowhere near expectations, hanging near 250 and leaving the yard under 20 times a year. Something had to change. He needed a rebirth. Three years into his career, a new hitting coach was hired by Yamiyuri. And thanks to this hire, a rebirth was exactly what Sadaharu O oh was going to get. Hiroshi Arakawa had just finished molding Kihachi Enomoto into the powerhouse of the Daimai Orions that he was in the late 50s and into the 60s. Once again, Sadaharu O oh had crossed his path, and this time, his sage advice was going to stick. He could work with Sadaharu day in and day out. His lightning-quick mind noticed every little kink in the young man's swing. For one thing, he had no balance, the movements of his body were completely disconnected from one another, and his head was so unsteady he could only see the ball for an infinitesimal fraction of a second. Plenty of improvements could be made, and immediately, as camp began in early 62, the two men set to work. Arakawa's primary goal was to quiet the movement of the swing, so that every part of the body moved together, as in a well-oiled machine. The movement of the legs starts, which moves the torso, which moves the hands, which moves the bat. He tried several different new batting approaches in order to correct the hitch in Sadaharu's backswing that seemed to be the root of the problem. Of the many employed, one stood out as the most effective, as it seemed to neutralize the extra turn of the wrist that occurred when Sadaharu lifted his right leg. After all, when balancing on your back foot, it pulls focus from the other parts of the body and encourages connectivity in the movement of the swing. The results were there, but Sadaharu never adapted what would later become the flamingo style fully. And to start the season, he and the Giants were slow out of the gate. The team could not string together a winning streak of any note, and by the end of June, he had only nine home runs to his name. Even Nagashima was struggling to begin the year perhaps feeling worn down from putting the team on his back all those years. The Giants had no pitching. Their normally reliable hitting core fell silent, and the man in the middle of it all, Sadaharu O, oh, was getting blamed for all of it. This tumult came to a head on the 30th of June. That day, the Taiyo Whales handily shut the Giants out. In a game that saw Sadaharu hitless with a pair of strikeouts, he was pinch hit for in the fifth, and that was all she wrote. Sadaharu drove home with Arakawa that night. They'd begun to bond as player and coach throughout this season, and the young man trusted his teacher as not just a teacher, but a friend. Arakawa worked him hard one-on-one -on -one outside of games and practice, and he had taken some positives from the 62 season so far, but nowhere near what he wanted. They returned to Arakawa's home and commenced their customary dry swing training for the evening. As Arakawa tells it, this is how that conversation played out. If the pitcher goes from the stretch tomorrow, I want you to start your swing quicker. I don't think I can hit anything doing that. My hands are too slow. Don't swing with your hands. Swing with your body. That night, the decision was made to swing with one leg in the doubleheader the next day. Much to the indignance of the coaches, Sadaharu was set to hit third in both games and the ever-present doom and gloom in the Giants' dugout looked like it was going to continue for another day. No one seemed to notice Sadaharu's new approach in batting practice. A normal game in the middle of summer between two Central League rivals was about to enter into the history books, and no one 
knew it yet. Giants' fortunes were about to change, because Sadaharu O oh was about to take hold of the team itself for the very first time. Tayo right-hander Makoto Inagawa started Game 1. Despite giving up some hits in the first few innings, including one to O, oh, he felt very confident going up against this joke of a slugger in the three spot for the Giants. Sadaharu strode to the plate on the top of the third for the second time that day. He'd already whacked Inagawa's fastball into right in his first at-bat, so the rookie right-hander thought this first-ball fastball hitter would be flummoxed by a first-pitch curveball. He went into his motion as, just as his coach had taught, O's left leg dug straight down into the dirt as his right leg floated off the ground towards his belt. The pitch released. He was going to drop in low, right on the edge of the inner half. He saw it all the way in. With his whole body primed, O's right foot hammered into the box again as his left knee barreled through the zone towards the ball. His bat snapped to its target soon after and sent Nagawa's breaker right into the air. One of the most eventful three quarters of a second in Japanese baseball history. Everyone watching, on both teams and in the stands, was stunned. No one had ever seen anything like it. And, as we know today, they hadn't even seen anything yet. He finished game one with three hits and four runs batted in. In game two, he went hitless. But it was still a great day. Arakawa was pleased, and at his recommendation, Sadaharu O oh threw himself into training his new, unique style of hitting. The fans were utterly captivated by every detail. And when, on one occasion later that summer, cameras were led into a session of this strange training, they couldn't keep their eyes off of him, and would never again until he retired. Musashi set out from his village to learn as many sword styles as he could from all the great masters of Japan testing his own abilities against the best that their schools had to offer. He walked the long road across the country to the ancient capital of Nara. Once proud, it had fallen into disrepute and disrepair, with brigands and belligerent ronin as the only law in the prefecture. Musashi made his way to the famous Hozoin Temple, where the monks that tend to the daily affairs of the temple had a penchant for lance fighting. And though it is not a normal martial arts school in the traditional sense, it has become a pilgrimage for anyone who wants to learn how to excel fighting with the lance. At the Holzoin, he runs into an old monk tending to the garden outside. But the young Musashi is so overcome with the piercing gaze of the elderly holy man, he can barely look him in the eye. He looks away and enters the temple. Inside, he challenges one of the brutish senior students of the temple. Agon, and beats him easily by channeling his brute strength wielding his wooden sword. Insulted, the monks agreed to meet him, along with an accompanying force of Ronin. They challenge Musashi at Hanya Plain the following day. Musashi meets them alone, and once again, channeling his strength, fights like a man possessed against the Ronin and wins. The monks turn on the Ronin and kill the rest of them. Shocked, Musashi meets the architect of this odd conflict, the old monk he met earlier in the garden. His name was Nikan, and he was the abbot of the Hozuin, and the finest of the lance fighters. Musashi thought this master warrior would be impressed, but the monk was underwhelmed, and left the young man with a piece of simple but very potent advice. You are too strong. O oh and Arakawa worked together from 5 a.m. to 10 in the evening, on and off the practice field. The training was focused not on strength and power, but balance, focus itself, and precision. He trained with barely any clothes at all, along with no shoes, so as not to restrict his movement in any way. Arakawa wanted Sadaharu to have the ability to stand on his back foot with his knee elevated for as long a period of time as possible. 30 seconds became two minutes, gradually even as long as three minutes standing on one foot, eyes front, body primed to come alive and drive towards the ball. Every tiny mechanic of the swing was examined and meticulously crafted to form the perfect singular movement. O's teacher worked meticulously on his mental approach too. Together, 
They studied multiple other disciplines to find the ideal physical and mental state to achieve in order to hit the ball. In terms of movement, the silent, light, deliberate actions of Noel and Kabuki actors proved fruitful in understanding how to unify all parts of the body and propel it towards one action. This was expanded upon by both Arakawa and O oh practicing regularly at the dojo of Morihei Ueshiba, the Grand Master of Aikido, in the twilight years of the legendary martial artist's life. In Aikido, there are no enemies, only opponents. There is also no attacking or aggression in Aikido, only the redirection of chi. Where this applies in a baseball context, when the pitcher delivers his chi through attacking with his fastball, your goal should not be to attack the ball with a hard swing of the bat, rather to meet the energy of the ball with an accurate, precise swing in order to meet and direct it in the direction the batter wants the ball to go, similarly to a perfectly timed grab and throw when physically fighting an opponent. To achieve this meticulous timing, O oh also worked to master the handling of something a little sharper than a bat, the katana. Unsurprisingly, there are real bodily consequences to swinging a sword with too much strength and too little accuracy, so there was a real incentive to tighten the mechanics up. Sadaharu added rounds of cutting objects up with the sword to his batting routine in his sessions with Arakawa, and eventually he began swinging the bat in a very similar way to how he directed the sword. His coach devised a number of creative drills to hone his approach, the most famous of which was ingeniously simple. Arakawa hung a piece of paper on a string from the ceiling. Sadaharu's task was simple. Put a precise slash on the paper and cut it in half. If timed incorrectly, the force of the swing would blow the paper back into the air in the direction it came, or the swing would come in high and cut the string even low and miss altogether. This took some adjusting, but eventually he got very good at it and wowed the crowd with a demonstration of this drill when they came and visited practice for the benefit of the cameras. When he went back to swing in the bat, he was able to strike the ball right on the screws. His swing, honed by the katana practice, is why you very rarely see pop-ups or even high arcing fly ball home runs from O throughout his entire career. He loads, bat in front, dropping his front foot, starting his body downward, shoulders down, and as the ball gets closer, he times the snap of his hips up to the very last possible moment, eyes fixed in, in just the right direction to see the ball clear as crystal. Once contact is made, he drives so comparatively low to the ground than most other hitters that he doesn't pull out of his swing path and upwards back to his full height until long after the ball has been driven far out towards the wall. And that right there is how you create an automatic home run swing. This, of course, was not Arakawa's goal. According to Sadaharu, his hope was that Sadaharu would be able to take three perfect swings in a row with nothing different between the three attempts, all parts looking exactly the same. One day, several years into his training, Sadaharu actually achieved this, not long at all into the morning's workout. Arakawa commanded him to stop immediately and go home to get ready for practice, saying, I have nothing I need to teach you today. All that work did not take long to pay off. Oh, and the Giants hit the ground running in 1963. Sadaharu was the runaway success of Central League on a Giants team that seemed destined for a Japan Series victory. And indeed, that's exactly what they got, with the added bonus of a revenge series against the Nishitetsu Lions. Shigeo Nagashima, catcher Masaki Mori, and Sadaharu all made the Central League best nine for the Giants. Sadaharu himself hit over 300 for the first time in his career, continuing to do so for an eight-year stretch throughout the remainder of the 60s. His OPS jumped 150 points, getting on base 45% of the time and slugging over 600, both for the first time ever. In the process, notching 30 doubles, 40 homers, and 106 runs batted in. And the cherry on top, he slashed his strikeout total by nearly a third, 
going from 99 and 62 to 64 and 63. Impressive numbers to be sure, and the best of his career by far. But he, his coaches, and all the fans were nowhere near ready for the 1964 campaign. 320, 456, 720. A 1.176 OPS. His walk number was the exact same as his RBI total, 119. And to top it off, he hit more than a double the home runs that he did doubles. 24 to a single season record 55 home runs. A mark unmatched until Randy Bass in 1985, and not by a Japanese hitter, until Munitaka Murakami, just one year ago at the time of this video's release in 2022. Everyone in Japan knew his name now, and he became the most feared slugger across the islands. Endorsements, interviews, fan letters, the works, all dominated his life in an instant he had arrived. Everything he'd faced throughout his 24 years of life, governed by the malevolent forces seeking to slow him down, had failed to do so. This was more than just fortune. If this was all fortune's doing, the Giants wouldn't have finished third in the league and failed to sniff the playoffs in 1964. Anyone who's ever set their minds to anything in life will tell you that hard work, persistence, and even skill cannot truly guarantee victory. Someone has to lose, has to come up short. Only a very small percentage of people actually get to achieve their dreams. Life happens, people get sick, money runs out, tragedy strikes, and of course, every person is not given every opportunity, even for something as simple as the race or gender you're given at birth. But every once in a while, all your efforts take you to the promised land. Sadaharu O oh was not born Japanese, was born very frail and sick, lost his twin sister before he'd even turned five, survived the firebombing of Tokyo, lost in the final at Koshien twice, disappointed the entire Giants fan base in his debut season, and was on the brink of washing out of NPB altogether. In the face of all this, he did what he'd always had. Nowered his eyes, tucked his head, and ran, and he kept on running until he cleared that hill. The king of strikeouts was no more, and the king of baseball was here. There is an old proverb that transcends cultures worldwide. In all of us, there are two wolves. One is the best version of yourself, your happiness, your strength, your skill, and self-assurance. The other is your weakness, your doubt, your pain, your anger, and all your fears. Inside us all, these wolves are locked in an eternal conflict, and will be until the end of life. The question remains, which wolf wins? Musashi strode through the woods on the outskirts of Kyoto in the wee hours of the morning. He knew, once he reached Ichijoji Temple, Seventy men of the Yoshioka school awaited him, murder in their eyes. They were up for blood after Musashi beat their leader, Seijiro, and his brother, Denshishiro, in one-on-one -on -one duels. Men hid in the bushes and in the trees with guns and bows to ensure Musashi's defeat. The fairness of the fight be damned, honor was at stake. Nothing whatsoever said that Musashi had any right coming out of this encounter alive. As strong and extraordinary as he was, fear still gripped his every move. He entered the clearing, heading into the temple to make an offering to the gods, hoping against hope they'd aid him in his battle. He knelt, closed his eyes, but all at once stopped himself. Almost unconsciously, he rose again, turned to go, and drew his sword. As he walked to face his enemies, one thought, gripped his mind. Respect the gods. Do not depend on them. The fight began, he focused his energy, and raised his sword. What happened next is debated ad nauseum. It's nowhere near actual history, but still the story persisted. 
71 men entered the valley that night, and only Musashi walked out. What actually happened during the fight, win, lose, or draw for Musashi, is irrelevant. Whether he lived or died that night, one thing remains clear. In both the legendary and historical versions of Musashi's tale, the wolf that wins inside of us is whichever side we feed. Thank you for watching part three of our series, The King's Tale, here on the Global Baseball Network. Please do like and share this video if you enjoyed it, and you know somebody who would enjoy it right along with you. And be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon down below the video screen to be notified every time we upload a new video to get you your fix of the world's greatest game. Please do click the link that I've got in the end screen here if you missed the first two parts of this series, and obviously there will be more on the way. I've been Marshall Emert. This has been part three of The King's Tale here on the Global Baseball Network. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next one, but for now, that's the game.